Scene 49, take one. My name is Peter Greco. Um, originally from New Jersey. Came to downtown after living in West Hollywood for about a year. I got divorced and I wanted to start a whole new life. And I found out about downtown. There were a lot of artists moving in the neighborhood. Got a pretty good deal on a loft and moved in on Bigness Street, right near First. That was 86. To pay the rent, I've been doing what I was trained to do in college. I went to the School of Visual Arts in New York. And basically, I was doing entertainment logos for, for movies. But yeah, it's funny, when you live downtown, you get this urge to paint on the walls. It's just like unavoidable. And there's so much great graffiti around, and I decide I'm gonna do graffiti. My favorite graffiti piece I ever did. I was in the Dada organization trying to improve downtown and create this art show. There was a point where we were trying to decide the name of the arts district. Joel came into the meeting with like a list of possible names. A lot of them were Indian names. He had done all this research and found like the names of the tribes and the chiefs, the Indians who had occupied this area camped like along the river. But at some point he proposed using the name East End. And I thought, wow, that is a really cool name. It fits because this is like the last street in a way in the city, you know, the downtown area proper. It's the very end. And it sounded like London sounded European or something. The landlords on our board wanted to call it loft land. Can you believe that? Just horrible. So I decided I'm going to get people to call it East End. So I created a sign, like a five color stencil with like a train, skyscrapers and city hall, of course, in the back and art deco kind of letters that said East End going through the middle and the whole design was like in a circle. And I started putting that up on walls. There's actually one still left from 25 years ago. It's covered with ivy. It was the landlords who were fighting for loft land because that helps them sell lofts. But we were arguing that the name had to sound kind of cool. The need for coolness outranked their need to sell lofts. Of course, it ended up being the arts district, which is a lot better than Loftland, but not quite as good as you know, East End. It was a little scary at first, to tell you the truth, because it was always so dark. My car is like right outside my loft. I lived on the ground floor. My battery got stolen 16 times in the 14 years that I lived downtown. I think that might be a record. We were so close to East LA, they'd just take the battery and put it in their shopping cart and just go across the bridge to those auto places and sell it. And then I'd go to the same place and buy the same battery back for 15 bucks, you know, the one they stole from me. So I was recycling. One of the funniest times the battery got stolen, I was in the loft with my girlfriend. She's working away and she had a worker, with someone helping her, who had just arrived. And she said, oh, by the way, um, your car's almost ready. Your mechanic told me to tell you they'll be ready in like 10 minutes. I go, we don't have a mechanic working on our car. And we go outside and the hood's open. The battery was gone. Just in broad daylight. My girlfriend went crazy. And she picked up like a broomstick and ran across the first street bridge and halfway found him there and with a shopping cart and just started pounding on him with the stick. It was, it was pretty funny. We actually had to stop her. We took his shopping cart so it wouldn't be so hard to carry the battery home. Yeah, it was a homeless guy. I don't think he ever did that again. When I think back to that time, I think of all the different characters in the neighborhood. Very colorful, flamboyant characters, transvestites and heroin addicts and geniuses and crazy people and everything you could think of. Seemed like people that had to live downtown, like wouldn't have been home anywhere else in the city. It was always like this feeling of what are we going to do with this neighborhood? It had so much promise and it was unclaimed. It was the kind of place where things would spontaneously happen like on the street without permission from the police. I remember one time, I think it was the Beastie Boys, asked me if they could plug their amps into my loft, and they just played in this dirty alley in like the middle of the night. It was the only place that really felt like a neighborhood. People knew who you were, and there was like gossip 
I can't imagine that kind of situation in, anywhere else in the city. As a matter of fact, that's what Joel loves so much, I think, about it. The fact that it was like a neighborhood. You really felt like you were on, in on the beginning of something, which doesn't come around very often. So many things I, I miss, like when I first came to L.A., all the other graphic designers were telling me, oh, you just missed the era of the album cover art. Now we have to do movie logos. That's the only work around. And so I felt like, ah, oh, I just missed that. Damn. But then when I moved downtown, it was the opposite. I felt like I'm finally like kind of in on the start of something, something good. It was such a great idea. Like, who's going to open up a general store in this neighborhood? But it was exactly what we needed because there were no supermarkets except the, the Japanese one. Well, he also said it's going to be a cigar lounge and a video rental place. He had that cigar store Indian he would always put outside. And I said, how about I make a sign that kind of goes with your Indian? Is that kind of old world cigar box kind of a feel? And he was like, yeah, yeah, go for it. He just gave me total creative freedom. He ended up not necessarily really being a sign, but I did this for him. This is the original painting. And I kind of gave it a little bit of an American Indian feel. And he loved it just because it's the first time he ever saw his name like painted beautifully. And he was just really into it. I mean, I hear people tell me he was like kind of mean and grumpy. And I have heard him yell a couple of times, but he was always really nice to me. When you'd go into his store, he'd be like, what do you want? And I never, ever got the sense that he was really in a bad mood. I think he fooled a lot of people, but I think that was his way of just cutting through the bullshit. And he really meant it. Like, what do you want? And he expected an honest answer. And I'm a very sincere kind of person. I just would actually try to answer his question. Sometimes I would get philosophical and tell him what I want out of life. Other times I'd be like, oh, I want cigarettes and gum and a movie. But there was also never any discussion of money. This was for the good of the community, his store. Of course, he wanted to make a living from it. He gave me free video rentals in exchange for doing a sign. But we never said, like, how many. After about six months, I just told him one day, I think I've taken enough free videos, I'm going to start paying. And he was like, yeah, that's a good idea. You know? well, like he'd been thinking about how to always shortchanging him. But again, he was just kidding. He's an actor, so he like, like puts on that harsh exterior. But uh, he was the greatest guy. The next place I lived was on Bay Street. I really liked the Bay Street loft. It was much bigger. We had about 3,000 square feet. The landlord wanted us in the building. As a matter of fact, when we moved there, he asked us how much we wanted to pay because he basically just wanted people to live there to keep it up. And we had access to our roof. We actually watched the L.A. riots and could see the whole panorama of the city smoking and the noise, the sirens, it was gunshots. It was really something. One time at about 12 o'clock at night, we hear somebody peeing on our dumpster. We just say, hey, get out of there. He's like, oh, sorry, sorry. Then like 10 minutes later, we hear someone clumping around on our roof. And we come up to the skylight and we go, who's that? And he said, oh, don't worry, it's Charlie Sheen. And the girlfriend was like, you're not Charlie Sheen, get out of here. And he like came over and go, no, really, I'm scouting location for a movie. And we go, how'd you get on our roof? He said, someone let him in on the other building and he crawled up their fire escape and then over to our building. And he just wanted to kind of look around. So you never know who you're going to meet, even in like back alleys of L.A. The day we were moving out of the loft on Vignus, it was like 7 in the morning. I got up, pushed the roll-up gate up, and my back went out. Now, we have tons of stuff, heavy machinery. Then it was just my girlfriend and my buddy. Like, how are we going to do this? We have to move today. I was like screaming in pain. And out of nowhere, Forrest Whitaker. The actor came out of the loft and he's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I told him and everything and he kind of felt really bad for me. And he just started moving all this equipment into the truck. I never saw anybody work so hard. He didn't even talk. Such a nice guy. I didn't know Don that well. He was always kind of a very mysterious person to me. The first time I really talked to him, he was walking down the street and, you know, he's got the mustache and he had a really nice suit on with some very crazy shirt. It didn't match at all, you know? So he had like keys hanging from his ear. And I asked him, are those your house keys? And he goes, oh yeah, yeah, I, I, this is where I carry them. And it ruins the line of my suit. Another time I told him I had a bad experience with a landlord and that he's threatening to evict me. And he said, oh yeah, I heard about that guy. 
why don't we burn down his building? And I was like, what? And he's like, sure, we'll burn it down. And I didn't know whether he was serious or not. I think he liked the sound of it more than the real idea. But then I, I was like, oh, it's like solid concrete. And he said, well, then we blow it up. <laughs> I was like, man, you got the solution for everything, you know? But he was always like off on some trip somewhere, traveling around. And one time I remember him giving me his business card. It was just like little letters that just said like stuff. And first I thought like, oh, maybe he makes crappy art. And I said, you mean art, art stuff? And he was like, no, anything, whatever you want. I said, you mean like, like mushrooms? I can get some mushrooms from you? And he said, oh, sure, sure, no problem, you know. It seemed like he was like from another time, another world. I always had a sense with him that like he was searching for something. It's changed radically from when I first moved down here to now. It's just more populated, for one thing. All the buildings are now very professionally managed, whereas before it was kind of a free-for-all. I think that, I don't know how big, but I think there, there could be, whether it's a mile radius or whatever, I think there can be a thriving arts community here. I think in a lot of aspects, it's turned into what he was hoping it wouldn't become very gentrified and people just sort of moving in and not really being part of the neighborhood and the community. But at the same time, if he was around, he would have seen there's lots of opportunities. There's actually more going on. One of the differences is that today, if you want to get anything done, you have to put some money behind it. It would just happen by itself. But one of the best things about it that I like is almost all the walls have art on them. That is what I want to see happen to this neighborhood. I want to see every square inch covered. To me, a blank wall is really boring. And I really believe in graffiti and in mural art very strongly. As a calligraphy artist myself, I have lots of rules that I follow, like I never would tag a bridge. I don't think graffiti belongs on bridges. It's an eyesore because a bridge has a beautiful line and shape and you don't want to fill that up with stuff. But a building, a blank wall is like begging for something. In a way, I feel like we're actually, by doing that, you're actually raising the value of the property and the neighborhood and the community. And I'm always on the lookout, too. I want to see more signs. Businesses are always trying to think of how to, like, underdo their sign or architecturally just fit it in, you know, so it's inconspicuous. I, I hate that trend. I want to see beautiful signs everywhere. So it really looks like the, there's life and activity going on and creativity. When I see like a beautiful mural or someone really spend time painting, I think it's wrong to just go over, especially with a crappy tag. But I think that there is a way to add your art to somebody else's art without ruining their art that enhances their work, that shows that you've really looked at their work and thought carefully about where to place it. I think that's really important, placing graffiti and street art in places that kind of look like it belongs there, like it wasn't done haphazardly or thoughtlessly. One of my East End pieces, it had this giant blank wall, and I just put it at the very edge because it just looked neat there. It looked really nice. And I came out of my loft one day, and Chaka was scribbled right on top, and the rest of the wall was left blank. I mean, this guy went out of his way to tag my piece of art when he had the whole wall empty. That kind of pissed me off, but I kind of thought it was funny. It was so ridiculous. I've seen some really beautiful, very complex, traditional kind of spray can art. And then sometimes an illustrator or an artist will get permission to paint that wall. And they'll just like cover the whole thing, paint it out, and then put their painting on that. I would never do that. I mean, if someone offered me a wall that I thought was really well done, I would probably leave most of it and put my work interjected into the piece so it becomes even richer with like another layer. It's so sad to see some of the really beautiful stuff just disappear. The wall on the American, we sort of expect that to be constantly changing and metamorphosizing. And I think that people who put up work there kind of understand that. And it becomes a pentimento, like built up layers. The wall is so thick with paper and paint, it has a life of its own. Cut.